What if a conversation could change your mind about yourself and about the world? What if a conversation could one day lead to a change in government policy? I'm Dr. Mark Halloran, and you're listening to Deep Trouble. The Deep Trouble podcast is presented by Trouble Magazine at troublemag.com. Thanks for listening. Okay, it's time for Deep Trouble again. And of course, once again, I have Dr. Mark Halloran with me. How are you? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in our lockdown, by the way, folks. Uh, yes. If you can hear that slight ring to our voices, it's because <laughs> we aren't in the same room. All right. Well, tonight's episode, you're going to be interviewing Joe Huston. This came out of the interview you did with Peter Singer. That was a contact for Joe, wasn't it? Yeah. So Joe Huston is the CFO. He works for an organisation called Give Directly, which is on the list of charities which are listed in Peter Singer's organisation, Life You Can Save, and also on the website GiveWell, which lists effective organisations that are involved in effective altruism. And so Give Directly is an organisation which provides a version of um, universal basic income to African countries like Uganda as a study to see if this is more effective than giving in-kind donations. Right. So when you say a a universal basic income, one Mm. might be led to believe this is ongoing. I mean, income is a regular thing. They're not just one-off payments. They're not just Mm. like a series of payments that have an end time. No, no, they're regular payments that come in in intervals of... There's a fairly well thought out system with mobile phones and internet banking. And so there are only fairly small proportions of money as well, because in Uganda, you don't need very much money to subsist. The study is for 12 years. That's their longitudinal study, as far as I can remember. There would be means testing for this, wouldn't there? No. There's no means testing. That's what's basic universal income. They've selected villages and they've randomly selected villages in places like Uganda where some places get a version of universal basic income and some don't to compare what the outcomes will be. The idea is that if people are given enough money to be able to live and they're not on the verge of poverty or potential starvation or food insecurity, that once their basic needs are taken care of, This is also the basic premise of basic universal income. And we also talk about this in another interview with Professor Gigi Foster, Mm -hmm. that uh, once people's basic needs are met, then they are actually free to pursue businesses and to be more entrepreneurial. And that's the idea behind it. Right. It's a very interesting concept. In some ways, here in Australia, we do limited runs of this kind of thing, don't we? I mean, for instance, a job keeper idea it is in microcosm in a way. Mm. Since COVID-19, I should say, Give Directly has started to trial exactly the same program of providing basic universal income in parts of America to right. help out with the financial distress that certain communities are facing. Well, over here in Australia, of course, we feel that that kind of help to somebody isn't just financial help to that one person because that money then circulates through the system, doesn't it? That person buys something from a local Mm. trader, that local trader then has that money to buy from someone else. Mm. It has a multiplying effect. Yeah, so if you've got money to spend, it goes through the entire community and, and also stimulates the economy. That's what stimulus packages are for, essentially. Okay, I'm sure that our listeners will find this a very interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So let's have a listen to Dr. Mark Halloran in conversation with Joe Huston, Chief Financial Officer of Give Directly. I want to talk to you about your work with Give Directly and the history and the rationale of Give Directly. Yeah, absolutely. So what Give Directly does is very simple. We give money to people who need it, no strings attached. Um, And and the history comes out of, uh, you know, some of your listeners might know that recently the Nobel Prize was just in uh, in economics was just awarded to three economists who really sort of pioneered 
bringing experiments into economics and sort of replacing some of the theory and aphorisms with putting things to the t- test in the same rigorous way you would a medicine. And sort of as a result, in the early 2000s, there was a big wave of new studies and new learning about what works and what doesn't. And there were some surprises. It turns out that our track record at things like training or job skills programs is pretty bad, that we spent billions of dollars on it and uh, haven't figured out how to consistently do that well. And then on the flip side, that one of the things that's been uh, one of the sort of more consistent development interventions in terms of producing positive results is just giving people money. And so uh, when, when we were first founded, our founders were at economics grad school, were looking at that emerging literature, and then also seeing that there wasn't a nonprofit exclusively devoted to delivering cash. And so that's how we got started. I know we know um, from, I think it's researched by uh, Chandel and uh, Seidel, uh, and this is uh, outlined in Peter Singer's book, uh, The Life You Can Save, that $130 billion is spent a year on aid, but if uh, $66 billion was effectively spent, we could wipe out poverty in one year. And we know that traditionally donations to charities have been in-kind donations. I think it's about 94%. So have those donations to those charities been largely ineffective? I think they certainly haven't been as effective as they could be. You know, one thing that I I think holds true is that the people we're trying to help in development, you know, people living in extreme poverty, they are dynamic actors in in the system as well. And so if you give them an in-kind aid that they don't want, they'll sell it and get the thing they want. And that's something that you see pretty consistently, whether it's food stamps or livestock or, you know, in-kind food or things like that, there is a pretty consistent pattern that people will sell the thing they don't want and buy the thing they do. And so then it just becomes a more inefficient cash transfer than if you had just sort of done done that from the first place. And and there are also other in-kind interventions that I think are doing a lot of good. You you know, the the type Peter Singer mentions in his book, whether it's uh, passing out malaria nets or deworming pills or things like that. But that's a narrow slice of a small, small proportion of uh, what the overall development sector looks like today. Because Give Directly is essentially proposing a, a form of basic universal wage or income. And that's what these experiments, I suppose you call them, are about. Yeah. Yeah. And there's different ways to get at it. You can do a universal basic income, you know, with a recurring payment. So we've got an experiment giving a about $20 a month uh, to people going out 12 years. You can also do it up front to try to sort of solve wealth poverty or wealth inequality with large grants. And so that's something we've done a lot of as well. Right. I know it started with a random controlled trial in Kenya, and I wanted to talk to you about that and some of the results from that. Yeah, absolutely. What's the best place to start? Well, I think we can look at some of the criticisms. So I know that the findings were that in terms of food security, so this was a uh, trial which involved you know, providing people with, as you said, uh, a form of basic universal income. And 64% of people at the start of the trial did not have enough food, but by the end, about 57% didn't have enough food. So it went from four days per year per child without food to about 2.5 days per year. Maybe some of the uncharitable criticism that it didn't provide food security, it just provided less insecurity. And I wonder what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I think something we've seen in our different studies is Different structures of cash, whether it's a large amount up front or a recurring payment, can be sort of engineered to help support different goals. And so if what you want to do is really boost food security, then the right answer is probably to have recurring cash payments going out into the future so that every month you know that the family has enough to put food on the table. If what you want to do is really enable investment or earnings growth, or you know the sort of big ticket investments in somebody's life, then one-time grants probably make sense. And so we've seen some studies where a certain structure of cash won't push the nutrition sort of needle all that much, and then others where you can really get a pretty strong effect. Yeah. As a trial, a study, well, I think they measured cortisol levels as well, and um, education, there was no effect, and health was no effect. And some of the other criticisms were that uh, 23% of the participants chose to replace their thatch roof, which was an indicator of their level of poverty or socioeconomic status with a tin roof. At that time, the people that were not realising that the donation was unconditional and it cost $400. But then one of the criticisms was that the thatch roof only cost $37 annually to replace. 
So it would take 10 years to get the investment back from the point of view of the investor, not from the point of view of the participant necessarily. I wondered what sort of things you'd learned from those early findings. And so it's absolutely true that, you know, going out, giving cash, it takes as much explaining in rural Kenya as it would in Sydney or New York. It's a, a weird thing to do. And so you have to take a lot of pains to make sure that people really understand that it's unconditional, that even if you're enrolling people, you know, based off of a, a poverty proxy, like uh, the material of their roof, that doesn't mean they have to do anything to their roof once they get the cash. And, you know, we're constantly sort of spotting issues like that and evolving. On the numbers itself, I think the math works that it's the sort of right long-term investment to switch from thatch to tin because the maintenance costs are actually fairly high. And the reason why people don't do it is that they don't have the upfront capital, but that's why they sort of choose those paths. And in that study, I think it's why you saw things like big increases in earnings and assets that people got the cash, looked at the sort of available in investments they could think about and made a handful of them and on average saw pretty big increases in earnings. Where do you see people mostly spending their money that you find on the ground is effective? I mean, I think the idea of basic universal wage tends to be fairly controversial and it raises a lot of cynicism. And so instantly people think, well, if you give people money, uh, that money will go towards alcohol, tobacco, things like that. But what are you saying? Right. I'll start with the wonky answer is that spending on those types of things is well studied. You know, economists doing these trials, both studying cash delivered by give directly, but also by governments and things like that, have looked at this exact question. And economists from the World Bank have a paper out that looked at 19 studies of cash transfers from around the world and found that spending on so-called temptation goods, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, things like that, either stays the same or goes down a little bit. And then economists from MIT looked at the other kind of big worry uh, that I think people have about cash transfers, which is work effort. You get some cash and you start working less. And they surveyed six studies across the world and found that people either work the same amount or work more even. And so that's the, the wonk answer. In terms of what we see on the ground, the first thing I'll say is that it's very varied, which I think is a big benefit of cash, that you can give one program, but then 100 people in a village can all prioritize whatever is their individual need. Some of the themes you see are livestock, people buying cows or goats or chickens, investments in their farm, whether that's buying seeds or fertilizer, renting land, buying a plow. And we typically see some investments in education in a lot of the countries where we work. Secondary school isn't free. And so there are pretty substantial, basically, school fees in order to enroll your kid. And so uh, we see a lot of people spend on that. I've met people spending on health and things like that. And so I, I think the sort of consistent themes are people spend on their top priorities. And it's reassuring that those top priorities aren't the doomsday scenario. It's more normal human things that uh, people need. Well, I've read that agriculture and livestock are still the best investments in terms of getting uh, the best return in terms of putting in $1 in relation to agriculture produces $2, where $10 invested in non-agricultural products or activities only produce $11. Is that generally what you tend to see? Yeah, I'm not sure. In part, you know, a lot of the people we work with are subsistence farmers, and so they'll often spend on improvements there. But, you know, the kind of global macro trend is that people are urbanizing, you know, and so we've both worked in urban areas and uh, you also see people migrate to urban areas and, you know, work different types of jobs. If Kenya or Rwanda develops, you know, dramatically over the next 50, 100 years, I think there'll be much fewer farmers than there are today. And so, yeah, it's tricky. And, and that it is tricky is part of why we like leaving it up to the people we're trying to help. So there is planning for the future, because I suppose one of the arguments from the people who are supporters of in-kind donations say that the money that's best spent on things like agriculture, crops, fortified food, water purification, is still best provided by in-kind donations because the rural communities need to have these shipped in and subsidised. But it sounds as though what Give Directly is doing is planning for a future where there will be less rural activity almost. I think a lot of in-kind aid starts with the sort of assumption that the people we're trying to help don't know what they need mm. or don't have access or things like that. And the reality is that subsistence farmers actually know quite a bit about farming. And if you're really good in very specialized ways, you can try to help improve them on those dimensions. But if you also give them cash, they'll invest in the sensible things they know about to improve cash. And they have access to markets near them to buy everything from malaria nets to cows to fertilizer. So I think that's a big piece of it, that you don't need policymakers or aid workers in 
Sydney or DC or London to chart out these people's lives. You can get them some cash and, and leave the rest up to them. You're listening to the Deep Trouble Podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Joe Huston, Chief Financial Officer at Give Directly. There have been also some cultural reasons for people uh, not accepting the money. Uh, I read uh, in one of your reports that in uh, Kenya, in Homa Bay, 40% of potential participants refused their cash payments. Could you talk about why that was, the reasons were for that? Yeah, that was super interesting. And so in general, across the countries where we work, participation or opt-in rates are very high, 95 plus percent, because it's a good deal. You get free cash. But in this county in Kenya, what we encountered was a lot of people just refusing to participate. And as we sort of dug into the reasons, it was a lot related to religion, that the particular kind of Christian sects in that area, there's sort of narratives around that you shouldn't take something for free, basically, that, uh, that that's wrong or unethical or that can't be good money. And that sort of connected with some superstitions around, including that maybe Give Directly was part of the Illuminati. But basically, just sort of, it didn't add up that people were coming in, knocking on your door and trying to give you cash. Mm. And so in this area, people were deeply suspicious. I know you've done some work in the United States as well, but I I suppose you encounter some of that probably reasonably healthy skepticism. Uh, Yeah, if somebody knocked on my door in New York and said they were offering a thousand bucks, I'd probably call the police. Uh, So yeah, so I think the skepticism makes a lot of sense and we've gotten better. We were always, you know, holding town halls with the communities before going door to door to sort of explain the program. At the time, we went on local radio to try to give people another perspective on what it is. Something we've been doing lately is having past beneficiaries talk to future ones, um, which I, I think is helpful as well. But yeah, it's a, a confusing program in many ways, and so and not your typical, and so it does take some explaining. Well, did you need to talk to the Christian churches as well and break down barriers there? Yeah. It was a lot of sort of going to the big church gatherings, the various levels of different types of elites, either government or religious or just sort of more community and yeah, and trying to sort of reach people. Um, we actually ultimately ended up leaving that county that it, it seemed like, you know, people there just didn't really want to participate. And in part, that makes it more costly to operate, but also we don't want our role to be all that disruptive to the community. And so we went elsewhere in Kenya. Oh, so you actually even just withdrew from that particular area because it wasn't, it essentially wasn't working because of those cultural religious reasons almost. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, maybe a few years down the road as people see that, you know, some of the people who got the money, you know, they're still doing well. I can imagine us going back. But uh, but yeah, that's what happened in that case. Because your current trial, you're looking across, is it seven African countries? The current trial is about 6,000 participants uh, across some of the poorest regions in Africa in terms of villages. So you're targeting villages that need the most assistance, essentially. And so I think the trial you're talking about is the basic income one. And that yes. one's actually just in Kenya. But yes, we're working in two very poor counties in Kenya. And then whole villages are randomly chosen to either be cash receiving or to be non-cash receiving. And then within the cash receiving, some villages are getting a basic income for 12 years, some for two years, and some a one-time grant to basically compare what structures of cash best support what type of priorities or plans. I mean, it seems like I wondered in terms of the analysis, does it come down at the finish of this in 12 years to each individual villages as well in terms of the way that they reacted differently? Because I imagine some villages have different cultures and different structures to others. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you can try to capture that in some of the survey design. You know, you can ask about how this affects how the community is interacting with each other, how people's life plans or dreams or what they think is possible change. But also, I think some of the more qualitative work of just going and talking to people can be interesting as well and informative. What other markers in terms of change, economic change, quality of life change? Are you measuring more than just people reporting on their quality of life? What are you looking at exactly? Yeah. And so for this study, it's, uh, you know, I think the debate about basic income thinks about a pretty wide range of outcomes. And so with this study, we've tried to measure a wide range of outcomes. And so it's a lot of detailed economic things around how much are people spending, how much are people earning, 
what are their assets. And that is self-reported, but they're also talking to a control group that's self-reported as well. And the surveyors are another nonprofit, not directly. And so that independence, I think, helps. And you can do additional tests to make sure that your self-reported data isn't getting all that screwy. And so there's kind of economic measures. There are important nutritional measures that you can look at. And some of them are inputs like food security or just how many meals with protein and things like that they're getting a day. But you can also look at outputs, look at the circumference of a child's upper arm or something like that to see, you know, are they just skin and bones or are they developing with muscle and fat? And you can look at their height and their ratios of weight and height and things like that to sort of capture those types of things. A big thing we're curious about is gender relations. The sort of balance of the evidence on cash seems to be that if you see a change in things like intimate partner violence, either emotional or physical, that cash transfers are usually associated with decreases in violence. And people talk about that in the basic income context, that if you give people their own support, they'll have more freedom, they'll have more autonomy and power in relationships. And so we're really curious to sort of get at that in a bunch of different angles of how does this change how families are interacting with each other. And at a sort of internal level, we're curious about stress, happiness, depression, life aspirations, and, and sort of seeing having a little bit of extra security plays into that. Because you've talked about, I think, with the Kenyan trial, that there was a decrease in family violence, there was an increase in female empowerment, which I imagine would be self-reported potentially. I mean, how many indices are you gathering in terms of data to assess all these things in, in relation to, it sounds like it's a change in rates of family violence and a culture of family violence in certain parts. Yeah, exactly. And so in general, this is about five rounds of surveying with different types of respondents. And so the cash recipients, village elders, the members of the family alone, the members of the family together. Um, and so it's it's hours of conversation with this third party evaluator and uh, both people getting cash and not. And, and so it's, yeah, dozens and dozens of indices to sort of track what the effects are. And it'll all be comparison of people who received cash versus the control group in, in the same way you would look at a medicine or something like that. It sounds as though it's 12 years, so it's not as though it's just going to be a before and after type analysis. Exactly. The first results will be out this year. And I think they'll be as important because one of the important comparisons, I think, is between the two-year group and the 12-year group. Those groups of people have been treated the same up until now, but one side knows that they have future security, which I think if you had a scaled up basic income or something like that, that sort of extra effect could be impactful. You know, maybe they're planning at a longer horizon or thinking bigger. And so I'm really curious about that comparison in particular. I think one of the issues that you faced early on that you've identified, and I'd be interested to see how you've solved this, was issues in relation to fraud with field staff. Um, so I read that in 2015, $60,000 was stolen from Kenyan MPISA agents that, that do the cash transfers. I mean, how do you go about rectifying this to make sure that you keep a track of you know, potential corruption? Yeah, it's something we're thinking about constantly. And, you know, it's a problem with any type of aid delivery or company for that matter. But I think cash has a, a sort of fo focusing effect on, on where it can pop up. And so the kind of measures we've taken are, in general, a move towards more independent checks. And so people who get signed up today will have three independent interviews over different days by distinct teams from GiveDirectly. Um, we also have an independent call center that's calling recipients as they're receiving cash, in part just to sort of solve customer service issues that come up, but also to understand um, what their experience was like, whether people asked for bribes or there were fraud attempts or things like that. And then something that we started a couple of years ago is a separate independent audit team that reports basically outside of the country structures directly to our COO. And their job is to be showing up in the communities, both while we're enrolling and while we're paying, uh, to try to detect these types of things earlier and also to try to deter them. Because, I mean, people are human. We have... 300 people, we're delivering about $50 million a year. These types of things are going to happen, but figuring out how to detect them early and deter them is the name of the game. You're listening to the Deep Trouble Podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Joe Huston, Chief Financial Officer at Give Directly. I think the change in terms of what Give Directly is doing and these other organisations that focus on effective altruism is focusing on actually providing empirical evidence that what they're doing has a measurable impact. I mean, is that fair, do you think? I think we're certainly ahead of the pack on that. We've got 
about 13 randomized control trials either completed or in progress. And so producing results across yeah, six countries. And it's adding to a body of evidence that's about 150 studies deep. And so, yeah, we've taken the, our role as kind of cash transfer design lab in addition to cash transfer implementer pretty seriously. Finland ran a basic universal income trial, and I wondered whether, I mean, you're probably aware of that, and what are the things that you've learned from those sorts of things? Because the, I guess the outcomes from the Finland trial were not overwhelming. Right. Well, in part, I think it's, I think it's in part, you learn that it's hard to do experiments on a large nationwide scale, mm-hmm. just uh, politically. And so the results themselves, I think the study was sort of set up to fail, that uh, what politicians were hoping would come out of the basic income is not what proponents of basic income are usually advocating for. What they're hoping for was that this would be a cleaner way to do unemployment insurance, that if you don't tie it to finding work, maybe people have a bit more time. If you don't sort of tie it to having work, then maybe there isn't this perverse incentive where you try not to find work so you can keep the unemployment insurance. And so the project itself ended up being mostly a trial of different approaches to unemployment benefits. And Mm. the people who received the cash were all unemployed folks. And the way the questions were geared was very much around which program will get people back to work sooner. Mm. And the programs were basically all the same on that front. If you dig into the data, there are signs that like people's lives were a lot better, that they were less stressed, happier, things like that. But the sort of way the study was framed and the discourse around it, I think it didn't sort of give it much of a chance for those things to come out. Well, I think possibly, I mean, you, the studies that give directly seem to be running, well, they tend to be randomized, but obviously focusing on the lowest tier of unemployment benefits, which is what they're providing to people. So it's it's really the lowest level of wage you could possibly provide, and they provided to about 2,000 people. There was an increase in well-being, I think, on self-reports and trust, but there was a focus not on really around getting people back into the labor market, essentially. Right. So I think that was probably the big distinction of the greatest issues. But it does make me think, I mean, I know that people like, uh, well, diverse number of people from Bertrand Russell and Thomas Paine and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, surprisingly even uh, President Richard Nixon were all supporters uh, and promoted UBI. In fact, Nixon uh, actually tried to... uh, tried to instigate a program like that, but was defeated by the Democrats, I think, because it was not considered to be generous enough. I wondered whether you felt like this was something that could work in any situation and context or in socioeconomic strata, or whether it only has applications in really specific areas and populations. I think there's an aspect of cash that's very generalizable. The specific implementation or the specific effects you see, I think, will vary a lot by context. But an aspect that's very generalizable is if you have a certain budget that you've set aside because you want to help poor people in your society or in your world, a good starting question is, can I do more good figuring out how to spend that budget, thinking about programs, being clever, talking to experts? Oh, then uh, you could by just giving the money and letting the people I'm trying to help spend the budget. And I, I think that core question is very generalizable, that if you think about developed world social policy, in the US at least, we have a sort of welfare system that has both a lot of gaps, uh, a lot of hoops to jump through, and a lot of non-cash support. Our sort of main welfare program actually gets granted down to states, and they can decide how to spend it on a whole host of things. There was an article recently about how some of the money, especially in the South, was going to marriage counseling, for example. And so I think that the U.S. might stand out for being particularly bad in this front. But that phenomenon is actually pretty general in the developed world, that you have a mixture of different types of supports, many of which that are either intentionally paternalistic or just not all that well conceived. Mm -hmm. And flipping the question and saying, why shouldn't the sort of budget just start in the hands of the people we're trying to help? And then maybe you would justify deviations from that. Well, it's actually very important to have a health system or something like that, or, you know, we need to have something around mental health. You can sort of start working backwards from that versus starting with this, you know, small, small portion going as direct unconditional cash to the people you're trying to help. I do want to talk to you about this because I think this is interesting. The basic universal income were implemented in a, you know, a first world country like the United States. Then 
that would then, because of the tremendous amount of revenue it would take to support a program like that, then medical care programs, private insurance, things like that would be made obsolete because the universal income had replaced all of that, those sort of social government supports. Is that the case? It depends who you ask. And I think it's a big risk. I think the politics of basic income are pretty fascinating, you know, because there's this interest on both the left and the right, but I don't think there's many policies they both co-sign to. And so I think one of the worst things you could do for poor people is take budgets that are currently means tested, focused on the poor and only those budgets and then universalize them because that would just mean far fewer dollars per person, basically. And so proposals like that, you see that on the sort of Charles Murray side of the debate mm. uh, where you take all of the existing social programs and then dividend it out to literally every person in society. I think proposals like that would be pretty bad for basically any country. I think if you want to sort of go down the basic income route, you have to be signing up for an expansion of the safety net, not a, a reallocation, if that makes sense. I mean, is that sustainable in terms of the tremendous amount of revenue that uh, a, a program like a, a universal basic income would require? I think mathematically, yes, that developed world countries, you don't have to have tax rates, you know, north of 60% or so on the t top earners to get those types of numbers. Politically, I think it's a different story that I, I think the United States or Australia would be pretty far from having a basic income, you know, that being close to the political debate anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you know, a country like Switzerland, where they had the referendum, that, that I think feels a little bit closer. And so I think the politics are the real constraint versus making the math work. I was interested in the future in relation to this, because I read about Silicon Valley billionaires and uh, feeling as though they may owe humanity a solution because AI has been predicted to, within maybe even 30 to 50 years, render much of humanity essentially a a useless class through mass unemployment. And I wondered if something like Give Directly is to some extent a, a first run trial for everyone. It's interesting. Yeah. You always have to question a little bit why this time will be different than, you know, the industrial revolution. But yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I, I sort of had no idea whether the doomsday automation scenarios will play out. Mm -hmm. I do think Give Directly and the other both governments and nonprofits who have built this evidence base, yeah, th th that'll be informative for mm -hmm. what policy tools we have available. And even if it's not the doomsday, if, if it's just um, as automation gets better, as mm. AI gets better, there's just lots of labor market disruption, people mm. finding new jobs, people getting laid off and you know training up on a new skill, how cash can play into that, uh, whatever sort of set of policy levers you want in response to that. I think th this evidence base will be pretty important for that. Right. Yeah, maybe I read a conspiratorial type of interest into it. I mean, I know that... I heard that executives in Facebook are interested in and donate heavily to things like Give Directly. And I wondered whether the interest was actually born out of this idea that we do need to look at basic universal income at sometime perhaps in the immediate future. It's interesting. I think the Silicon Valley donors that I have spoken with, I think they come to us more through the kind of effective altruist route versus the fears of uh, an automated future route. But uh I'm sure those donors exist for us as well. I was interested also just in terms of your um, connection to, because I think the focus on empiricism and, and the, the science and the social and economic science around it, if your connection to things like the Centre for Open Science, because it seems as though their aims and your aims are very, very comparable, essentially, in a lot of ways. We don't have any direct relationship to them, but I think we and economics broadly has benefited a lot from improvements in how the sciences approach experiments. And so, you know, for example, all of Give Directly studies are pre-registered, pre-announced so that uh, you can't just cherry pick the results that end up looking good. There's a pre-analysis plan uh, before you look at the results. So that you say, this is how I'm going to analyze the data versus we'll have academics look until they find something interesting. And then, of course, the sort of external evaluators. And so I think we've picked some of the kind of basic structures from improvements in uh, psych and, and uh, science research. So, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a sense of transparency to it. I mean, uh, if things don't work or you find things that are uh, counterintuitive, they don't end up in the bottom of the filing cabinet. Those studies don't end up filed away somewhere. Right, Exactly. You're listening to the Deep Trouble Podcast. Dr. Mark Heller in conversation with Joe Huston, 
Chief Financial Officer at GiveDirectly. It seems as though the effective altruism movement is the future. I mean, are the old not-for-profit charities that have been predominantly involved in, in aid, will their roles become less and less? Things like World Vision, things like Save the Children. Yeah, I don't know if it'll be they become less and less or they switch what they're doing. I think we're just at the phase with cash transfers, and I'd love to see this broadly for the kind of more effective interventions uh, where you're starting to see competition. You know, that it, it's not just, is this a crazy idea? Can you just trust people to give money? But you're seeing both on the sort of donor side and on the nonprofit side, more people trying to figure out the best way to do it. And I think that would be a better world if, uh, you know, the world visions and the say the children's and the cares are uh tilting hard towards, you know, looking at the evidence, figuring out what's effective and selling that they can do it better than, you know, the sort of upstart nonprofits on GiveWell's list or something like that. Well, are, are you starting to see that? I mean, are they are they changing their policy? Are they reaching out to uh, essentially take on some of these practices? Yeah, it's hard to say without being in it. You're certainly seeing more of a move to cash transfers. Um, I think that often gets mixed with a bit of old development, as in it's cash, but we'll put these conditions on it or we'll add this extra training that may or may not work. And so, you know, I think it's a, a, a muddy transition, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's happening. I suppose I'd come back to before, which I, didn't, I probably didn't get right to the bottom of, which was around uh, differences between groups. And I wondered whether there would be a difference between providing universal basic income to people in a first world country like the United States or Australia who are welfare dependent and experiencing generational poverty versus providing it to a village in, a, in an African country. I, I wonder if there are any differences or that we just don't really know enough about it until we actually try it. Yeah, I, I think I'm in that camp. But, you know, the Y Combinator study looking at basic income in the US, I think will be fascinating for those reasons. I think the drivers of poverty, there's an argument, I think a good argument that the developed world poverty is more structural um, in a certain sense that it's mm. about what policies have you had historically? How do you set up your cities? in the US, what have you done with race relations or slavery and things like that? And so it's also structural in the developing world. There's colonialism and governments doing their own things. But I think it may be at least sort of direct intervention, poverty alleviation, I think might be more complicated in the developed world. Yeah. Well, I guess your ability to be effective in the developing world is dependent upon relationships at the local village level and also with local state government. But I mean, how much trouble do you have in terms of dealing with countries that their, I guess that their government system is, it's just incommensurate with running an effective aid program like that is essentially despotic? Do you, do you just not operate in countries where that's occurred, where it's essentially a failed state? I think the closest to that is is we are working in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I think it's certainly harder. You just have to take fewer things as assumptions, you know, whether it's your security plans or that you can rely on rule of law to deter fraud itself or something like that. But And we're just actually getting started in the DRC, and so I won't uh, declare victory yet. But uh, But mostly I think it's doable that you can sort of do the kind of bread and butter work that we do and I should say it's DRC, not CAR or something like that. We're not yet to operate with a big security force or something like that. And so I think there are certainly places that are currently off limits to us. Is it in some ways easier than traditional aid in terms of in-kind donations? Because essentially all you need to provide people with, apart from the staffing and the analysis, all you have to provide people with is either a SIM card and a mobile phone that they can pay back through the actual study itself. So does it make it easier? I think so. And we're actually experimenting with ways to make it even leaner. We're doing a project partnering with one of the big telecom companies in one of the countries where we work. And they basically have you know, data on all of their users. And if you look at that data, you can predict who is poor. You can sort of see how much prepaid airtime are they buying at a time? Do they call people or do they ask people to call them? Do they receive airtime? Do they send it to others? Things like that. And so you can sort of build an index of poverty. And then we're just the beginnings of trying this out. But then you can sign people up purely remotely. And so that would you know, be the kind of next level of how can you even further disintermediate give directly. And so I'm excited to see how those types of things play out. But it's also true that our core model itself is pretty simple. 
you must require less resources to implement this in terms of it's a it's a balance of it costing less. So I, th- I think I read that eighty eight percent of every dollar that's donated is delivered directly to participants through the through the provision of the uh, income. And so is it amongst the best in terms of getting value for your dollar as an investor in effective altruism? I think so. I think it's if you think about the various effective altruism, I think of cash as the uh, the stock index of them, that because you know basically all of the budget is getting into the hands of people in extreme poverty, and because there's well over 100 studies that that works pretty well, I think you have a good reliable source of, of positive impact there that, you know, you can literally change lives giving a thousand bucks a year or something like that. And I think that's pretty remarkable. I think some of the other interventions have different impact profiles, if you will, you know, something like deworming. If you read kind of Givewell's review of it, they'll say, given the evidence, this probably doesn't do all that much, but there's a small chance it does an incredible lot. And so if you look at the kind of expected value, you say, okay, that's a good bet, but it's a different profile than cash transfers. And then something like, you know, animal aerial nets, I think is both highly reliable and and high impact. And so I think that, you know, maybe it's the, they've found a a good stock picker there, that they're the Warren Buffetts or something like that. Well, I guess it's a, it has less emotional content to it because, I mean, with malaria nets, it's the potential lives you save rather than the actual life that you save, you know, that it's a preventative measure and the cash is to some extent in the same category as that. But people seem to have something psychologically different when they think about cash donations versus other types of donations. And I wondered what you thought that was or, or what you knew about that. Yeah, it can feel more personal somehow that, you know, like it's closer to, I'm just sending some money to somebody. And ideally, if we're doing our jobs right, it could directly, it feels exactly like that. A thing we're trying to figure out is how to do that even better. How do you sort of connect people living in extreme poverty with funders and sort of remove, give directly more and more from the person in the middle? Mm. Historically, if you look at the kind of most successful fundraising machines, child sponsorship basically drove a, a lot of you know the growth in, in places like World Vision or, or Care or things like that. And it was because of that connection. And it didn't turn out to be all that real of a connection. You know, multiple people were getting the same letters from the same children and things like that. But I think creating that connection is a big part of uh, how you help people give. Mm. Well, I mean, we talk about the studies. I, I talked about that with Peter about, you know, people more likely to donate if they hear a story of disadvantage from one child rather than 10. And there's a feeling of, uh, you know, the problem becoming too great and being overwhelmed by it and personalizing the story. It seems to me that these types of interventions are really around increasing the autonomy of the people that you're working with. I mean, to some extent, in kind has traditionally been, and maybe I'm not being fair to it, but this is my impression, is about sort of me deciding what I think you need rather than allowing you to use your own judgment in terms of your experience in your own environment to decide what's most appropriate and effective for you. Yeah, I think that's well put. And it's the other big differentiator for Give Directly in the world of effective altruism that, you know, if you go to a site like GiveWell, for example, and you want to see what's behind the rankings of the different interventions or different charities, you know, there's a spreadsheet. And part of the spreadsheet is assumptions about the different research they've seen and you know, a dollar in produces what type of outputs, but it's also a spreadsheet of values. You know, people in San Francisco saying, well, this is how much we should value a human life versus increases in consumption, you know, versus anything else. And I respect GiveWell a lot. It's why I'm at Give Directly. I think they're doing great work, but yes. it's also worthwhile to realize how many assumptions we're making when we're sort of giving in kind that, mm-hmm. you know, we think they need this type of thing. Or if I were, you know, a subsistence farmer in rural mm-hmm. Kenya, I'd want to check in or something like that. There's a lot of assumptions baked in there that I think aren't all that well interrogated. Well, I know I read about, you know, the sort of providing things in bulk. So the village would end up with 10 water tanks or 20 water tanks and it wasn't required. So there's that sort of ineffectiveness and wastefulness that can sometimes go along with in-kind donations. And I think the idea of building people's autonomy obviously is a better idea. But I wondered if there was still any role within this research for decisions that are made that are paternalistic. Like, I think that to some extent, in-kind donations are a bit paternalistic, but I wonder if there is still a role for that. Yeah, this is something we debate internally. Personally, I would say yes, that I think 
if you look at you know some of the other high quality interventions, something like annual aerial nets or deworming pills or something like that, I think there's a good case that on the margin there are types of mistakes humans make a lot. You know, underpricing a certain risk or just not being aware of the scientific literature on something, or because they're only one person, not thinking about the externality for the whole community or something like that. And I think when people think about aid, they give too much credence to this belief and as a result, give almost none of the budget that shows up as cash transfers. But I do think there is a core truth to it that thoughtful, well-reasoned paternalism, I think, has a role. Well, I think about sowing in ionized salt throughout Europe and things like that and recruit, re- reducing the number of hypothyroidism and cretinism and things like that, that, that sometimes there is a role for right. I suppose you have to, I mean, things like um, Against Malaria Foundation, they've obviously spent time in the area talking with people and analysing the situation before they implement that. So it's sort of more informed paternalism. Yeah, and I think that's important. Something Kipwell has done that's interesting is trying to replace some of that spreadsheet on human values with you know in-depth surveys of trying to sort of extract what people value and what they want. And I think if you sort of don't go the cash route, or even if you do, it's important to figure out ways that you're still getting that perspective, because otherwise, I think you can end up with weird results. I'll return to the first thing I said, and um, we'll finish on this, but it, it, the statement that if $66 billion was effectively spent, we could wipe out severe poverty in one year. Do you think that's accurate? I think it's a more provocative thought prompt than it is a, a solution, you know, and so those numbers are effectively, if you could target, you sort of knew exactly. where the poorest people were and you could get in touch with them, you switch your fingers and instantly get cash to them, they would not be poor. But I think that's alighting over a lot of the details. But I do think it's a helpful prompt, which is, you know, if that's the sort of gap between extreme poverty and getting everybody above the poverty line and Aid is $150 billion a year. U.S. charitable giving alone is $400 billion a year. I think it's a helpful prompt to say, you know, do we have an allocation problem here? So I think it's helpful from that perspective. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. You have a good day. Bye. So there it was, the interview Dr. Mark Halloran did with Joe Huston. Mark, one of the things that Joe was talking about was a possibility of fraud, that when there's money dangling, there's a a whole host of people who want to get their hands on it, and including those people who don't mind using illegal means. Do you think that's going to go hand in hand with this kind of uh, cash payout system, that there'll always be people who will be trying to rort the system? Well, the short of it is yes. I mean, we talk about the issue that Give Directly had was having people on the ground support staff in places like Uganda who are supposed to be supporting the system in terms of setting people up with mobile phones and the cash transfers and things like that. And some of these officials that were hired by Give Directly were essentially committing fraud and redirecting funds into their own accounts. And as discussed in a later interview with Professor Foster, one of the issues of going into a country with potentially a corrupt government is that you have to be careful that the government officials don't find some way of getting around your system and redirecting those funds. I mean, we know traditionally probably that's been a problem for in-kind donations. Mm, Yes, yes. All right. One of the things that you mentioned is that cash like this could be spent on drugs, alcohol, Mm. or gambling. And in some ways, there's uh, been a feeling here in Australia that control should be put on welfare payments to remote Indigenous settlements for this very reason. What do you think about whether there should be strings attached? It didn't bear out in terms of the research in the places where Give Directly has gone, like Uganda. Mm-hmm. that people were more likely to spend it on gambling or drinking or smoking. That that was not the finding. But I do think when you're implementing, and I've talked about this in other places, when you're implementing any program like this, you can't assume that what works with one population will work with another. 
And so it's very, very context specific uh, and culturally specific as well. And they're sort of slightly different things. One is around state control, around the way that benefits are provided. Another one is a charity organisation coming in doing a study to see what will be most effective in, you know, whether this provision of direct cash is more effective than providing food implements that you can use to develop agriculture and things like that. Mm, I'm sure our listeners will have found that interview interesting, as they will next week's interviewee, Dennis Altman, one of Australia's leading intellectuals, academics, Mm who's had a great influence perhaps on our local queer politics. When I say queer, I mean to say that's a term that Dennis likes himself, isn't it, Mark? That's his preference. Yeah, that's his preference in terms that he uses to describe himself and his community. Yeah, so he's a professor at La Trobe University and he has written a book called Unrequited Love, essentially his autobiography about his life and his experience of the AIDS epidemic, which we actually don't really go into, uh, unfortunately, but also his experiences with people like Gore Vidal and Michelle Foucault. Right, Unrequited Love, Diary of an Accidental Activist, actually, Mm. out on Monash University Publishing. And the unrequited love, interestingly enough, at least Peter Craven, who reviewed the book in The Australian, Mm. said that it's really about our relationship with the US. Did you get that from the book? Yeah, well, I I did. I think the interview, we did get sidetracked on other things. But Dennis has been, you know, intensely interested in US politics. And so the book starts off uh, with essentially Donald Trump winning the US election. And the effect that had on personally on him and the people around him. But we should point out that Dennis went to America and he was there at a crucial time in the development of what they once called the gay liberation movement. He's a great thinker and talker. I was really definitely impressed with Dennis Altman's take on so many of the major issues of our time. And I was fascinated to learn that he had gone to the largest Quaker school in the world, Mm. the only Quaker school in Australia, which happens to be in Hobart. Mm. So join us next week here on Deep Trouble on 94.9 Main FM when Dr Mark Halloran interviews Professor Dennis Altman. Deep Trouble is produced by Steve Charman in the studios of Main FM, Castle, Maine. The Deep Trouble podcast is presented by Trouble Magazine at troublemag.com. Thanks for listening.